Welcome, family. How are you doing today? And I mean like really, not just the way you say, how you doing? And just like, how are you doing? Because last week, we opened up some wounds. We, we, we exposed our soul to something that God wants to do in our hearts and in our lives as we unpack the reality that God the Father is our Father. And so if you, as a child of God and a minister of the gospel, invited someone to be a part of the in-person gathering or to to join you or watch this video with you online, I just want to say to you that God is up to something today. And if you don't know me, my name is Lee Brown. I'm the lead pastor for this gathering of Jesus followers, and we are deep in this surgical process in our hearts And so I want to walk you together through some hope. See, uh, I want you to know this whole absent father wound thing we're talking about, I also walk in this wound. As a kid, uh, I knew from a very early age that my dad was doing things that we're beyond just like, hey, we shouldn't do this, right? Things that we don't even really talk about, things that ultimately landed him in federal prison twice. Uh, and, and I kind of had this idea in my life that maybe it was actually a good thing that my dad wasn't a part of my life. Like what if I had ended up like him? What if, I, what if he was in my life and I tried to emulate those destructive Patterns, But what I didn't realize until Jesus came into the picture, that this was both an excuse and a defense mechanism. See, without the roar of my father's voice in my life, I was wandering through the wilderness, facing all sorts of temptations and struggles on my own. And I looked everywhere I could for for other things to validate me as a man and tell me that I mattered. And look, my mom did the best she could to be both parents to me, but it's not in God's nature for her to validate a son as the man. But lucky for her, and I guess for me, the the idea, almost the fear, but the wrong kind of fear, of becoming my father sat on the back of my mind at all times so much that I didn't walk down those destructive paths paths. I knew at least what I did not want to be. But here's the trick. Knowing who you don't want to be isn't the same as knowing who you're called to be. And so I searched far and wide. And at some point, I think it was my youth pastor uh, who did this. Someone introduced me to the book Wild at Heart by Colorado author John Eldridge. And I've got to admit to you, that book broke me. Like I read it three or four times and kept finding new ways that I was going, ah, ooh, I feel this, right? It speaks things about my absent father wound that one, I didn't even know were actually there, but two, I didn't know how to describe for myself. And I kept reading that book over and over. But then one day, I was going through the, mall, that's the first outdated word you're going to hear, uh, and, and I happened by the Christian bookstore, that's another thing that doesn't exist, not just Christian versions of bookstores, but like most bookstores, unfortunately, uh, and then I found this audio CD of Wild at Heart. Like nowadays, we have audiobooks, right? And, and you know, they're, they're on the app and you just tap them, they're right there. And they've got scrollable text and, and all sorts of reminders. You can highlight things. But back in the day, you had these little frisbee-sized discs, right? And they couldn't even hold an entire book worth of audio. So this Wild at Heart set, I think was like eight or nine CDs. And so I, I remember I popped one of those CDs into my three-piece Iowa stereo that we all had somehow back in the early 2000s. No clue what happened to that company. Everybody I knew had that stereo. And so I put in the disc and I fell asleep, right? I, I laid down on my couch, I fell asleep, and I started to have the most vivid dream. 
Like I don't remember my dreams usually day to day. And so when I do, it's, it's really unique to me. And this one, I can still put myself in a mental like framework where I am right there in the midst of this dream. That night, so I was standing in the dream in the midst of our local community college's like green area, like the common area, right? And there were crowds of people who were walking all over. And then somewhere over here, there was this man who was getting everyone's attention by like talking to people. But, but it wasn't just like he was interacting with the crowd. Like he had a message that he was sharing, and as I got closer and closer to the speaker, I started recognizing I had heard this before somewhere. In fact, I can tell you some of exactly what I remember him saying in that dream. He said this, the story of Adam's fall is every man's story. It is simple and straightforward, almost mythic in its brevity and depth. And so every man comes into the world set up for a loss of heart. Then comes the story we're much more aware of, our own story. Where Adam's story seems simple and straightforward, our own seems complex and detailed. Many more characters are involved, and the plot is sometimes hard to follow. But the outcome is always the same, a wound in the soul. Every boy in his journey to become a man takes an arrow at the center of his heart in the place of his strength because the wound is rarely discussed and even more rarely healed. Every man carries a wound and that wound is nearly always given by his father. I stopped in the courtyard while I was listening to this man. I, I became hooked on every word, I couldn't figure out why this person I'd never seen before sounded so familiar. And then something happened in the dream. Like these happen once in a while to you. Like you glitch a little bit and you start to recognize that you're dreaming. And suddenly I realized that the words this man was saying was the book Wild at Heart. And so I was in that in-between state where I'm listening, but I'm also really confusing reality. And then finally, I woke up and recognized that my Iowa stereo was just on repeat on this disc. And I had listened to this same part of the book over and over again. But it was in that in-between space where something started to resonate in my mind. Even in my dream, I couldn't stop thinking about the fact that Eldridge in the book describes God takes us into the wilderness to lovingly reopen our wound. And that, that sounds like horrible, right? That's like, why would God do that? But the way he describes it, is it's like surgery. If you have an infection in a wound, like you have to open it up to get the infection out. And, and I started to recognize in that moment that that was what God was going to do in this next season of my life. And I knew I needed it, but I was also terrified of the scalpel, right? I heard the lion of Judah's roar, but I wasn't sure if the lion was friendly. It's like that moment in the Chronicles of Narnia where Lucy Pevensey looks at Mr. Beaver and says, is he, is he safe about this, this Aslan the lion, this caricature of, of God? And of course, Mr. Beaver's famous line, safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. And from that moment on, I recognized how God was leading me into the wilderness of my absent father wound. And you know, something interesting about scripture, it says that Jesus grew the most in the wilderness. Never liked that verse, to be honest, right? Uh, last week, we looked at the high point moment, the exciting moment where Jesus is baptized. Yay, that's exciting, that's celebration. And you would think, if I were writing the story, uh, right, 
that the next moment is worldwide fame, everybody comes to Jesus, life's good. But that's not what actually happens. Turn your Bible to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. If you don't have a Bible that you allow to go through you on a regular basis, download the Bible app to your phone or your electronic device of choice and check out the Bible reading plans. Like there's several that are short that are designed to kind of get you into a new habit and a new routine. So Matthew chapter 4 starting in verse 1 says this, then, that is after the baptism, Jesus was led up, notice by who? By the Spirit into the wilderness to what? To be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, understatement of the century here, he was hungry. The tempter approached him in this state of hunger, in this state of loneliness, in this state of vulnerability and said to him, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man must not live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. So Jesus is hungry, right? Uh, he hasn't eaten for 40 days or 40 nights. I don't know about you, if you've ever fasted before. Uh, I've fasted the longest ever. I've only did a couple times in my life, period, but the longest I've ever pa uh, fasted was for 21 days. And I can tell you, hungry didn't begin to describe it, right? It wasn't like I was a little snacky it was like my body was like, are you going to feed me or do I have to figure out a new plan on my own, right? I was vulnerable. I was weak. And in this moment, Jesus is met with temptation. And the first temptation is centered around his identity, right? If you are the son of God, that's a, <clears throat> that's a loaded word right there, right? Like loaded with doubt. And then he systematically begins to attack sources that we've talked about that drive us internally. First of all, he was tempted to become the source of his own provision. Men, when we operate out of our absent father wound, we become lone wolves. We decide we have to do all of this ourselves, right? It's the Thanos moment, fine, I'll do it myself. We don't trust others. We become the source of our own provision. That's a temptation, right? But Jesus responds back, it is written. In other words, he doesn't listen to the voice of the accuser and the tempter. He listens for the voice of his father. So the enemy changes tactics. Look at verse 5. Then the devil took him to the holy city, had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will give his angels orders concerning you and they will support you with their hands so that you do not strike your, right? Just listen to the babble coming out. It's not actually scripture that the enemy is quoting, at least not in the way that you quote it with power. It's like, hey, you want to use those words on that scroll over there? I can play that too. And so look at what Jesus says. It is also written, do not test the Lord your God. See, after testing his provision, the enemy changes tactics. First, he tries to get Jesus to doubt his identity in the voice of the Father. And then he tries to get Jesus to look to other false voices, false voices hopes to protect him. See, this time the enemy even misquotes scripture itself to come at the source of Jesus' protection. And by the way, the enemy will do the same to us when we don't turn our hearts to the voice of the Father because sometimes words in scripture can sound right but be misconstrued. And if we don't have that relationship, we don't feel that power. But Jesus knew the roar of the Father. And so one more time, verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor, and he said to him, 
I will give you all of these things if you would fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, go away, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him and the angels came and began to serve him. Some versions say minister to him. So finally, after failing to attack the source of his provision and then his protection, the enemy goes after Jesus' position, which is what he was softening him up for at the beginning, right? Remember, if you are the Son of God, and then he brings it full circle to say, hey, you know how I own all of this world right here? And notice Jesus doesn't say, You're wrong about that, right? Adam handed over the keys. Satan's offering him something he had the right to offer. He says, if you, if you would just worship me, I'll give you all of this. He tries to get him to listen to lesser voices. The voices of our wound instead of the roar of our father. And by the way, if you don't think that Jesus had an absent father wound, let me ask you this. Where's Joseph? Like from the age of 13 and the rest of Jesus' story, where's Joseph? I think he was too honorable of a man to have left. So it's likely that Joseph died. Right? Jesus had an absent father wound even while he was experiencing the roar of the heavenly Father. This sounds an awful lot like what we've been talking about these last few weeks. In fact, a few weeks, about six weeks ago, we talked about how the deepest longing in every human heart and soul is the the call to significance, security, and belonging. And right here, we see in the words of the accuser, attacks on provision, protection, and position. Yeah, they're a little different but they kind of sound alike as you go into it. The accuser is questioning the source of Jesus' significance, his relation to the Father, his, his position. He's, he's questioning uh, the, the rule of the Father in his life, the, the ability for Jesus to call upon the Father, the security blanket. Oh, won't there be angels? Why don't you jump off and see, right? But Jesus responds each time. Not just with words from a page or words from a scroll. It is written. He responds with the words of his father. It's like that moment, uh, you know, in, in The Lion King. We talked about The Lion King last week. Where Simba wanders off into the lands that you're not supposed to go to. The, the dark and scary drawings of the land, right? And he gets surrounded by these hyenas. That are mocking him, calling to him. And what is it that ultimately delivers him? It's the roar of his father. Here's the key thought I want you to understand today. God the Father is your father. That's it, pretty simple. God the Father is your father. See, in the article, Facing the Lions of Fatherhood, a writer in Christianity Today notes and starts out the way you're not supposed to do in any wedding speech, right? Merriam-Webster defines roar as a loud, deep cry, as of pain or anger. But then he goes on to explain, right? Our roar consists of the words, actions, and attitudes stemming from our deep places of anger and pain. The wound. We all have them. Injured spots where we still feel and act young. Many of them were inflicted by the roars of our own fathers who were still reeling from their fathers and their fathers' fathers when someone unknowingly bumps against our scars we react with greater intensity than the present situation warrants but pain left unattended and unexpressed tends to come out sideways as i began to unpack and understand the impact of my father's absence the lack of his roar, if you will. As I went into my own wilderness, I felt that loss of significance. How can I be a good man if I've never had a man show me what that means? I felt the loss of security, like the darkness was all around me and I felt alone and I felt that loss of belonging. 
the enemy tempted me, continues to tempt with so many things that all seem to come back to that absence of my father's voice. Can I share something deeply, deeply personal, like really pulling back the layers of the onion here? I have never in my life felt like I belong in the world of men. What do I mean? I mean that growing up without a father, the closest thing that I had was my uncle and my grandpa. And while my grandfather was loving and caring, he also worked like all the time. And so he wasn't around me as much. But my uncle was more often in my early years. And I looked up to my uncle, but I just... I didn't think that my uncle liked me. We didn't like the same things, right? He was really into sports, and, and, and it seemed to be all he talked about, and I, I didn't really like sports. But because of my absent father wound that was telling me there was something broken inside of me, that said that I wasn't welcome in that world. And I didn't realize, like this author writes about our wounds causing things to come out sideways, just how much that impacted me. I actually started noticing it, kind of maturing in this when I moved to Columbus. I don't know if you know about this, but uh, in Columbus, they really like this team called the Buckeyes, right? Like the Ohio State University Buckeyes are how people identify and define their identities. And so when I moved there, we were driving back from a hospital visit past the shoe, which is the stadium that the Buckeyes play in. And I offhandedly said something like, oh, that's where a few thousand people will be this weekend, right? And it was like everyone in the car just stopped and looked at me. And finally someone said, Lee, more like 200,000 people will be there this weekend. There will be a few thousand people in the parking lot who couldn't get tickets that are tailgating. And I'm like, oh my goodness, this is a big thing. And so not long after this, I'm in the church lobby and I'm this new discipleship pastor that people are trying to get to know. And this guy comes up to me wearing the uniform, right? The red, the gray, the Buckeyes colors. And he comes up and he starts talking to me about sports and I kind of cut him off like a little too loudly and very rudely saying, sorry man, I hate sports. I don't like watching them on TV. I don't like watching them in person. There is nothing in me at all that enjoys sports. And this guy just kind of stopped and walked away from me. And I had this moment in my soul, like, what in the world did I just do? What was that? It wasn't just me. It was the wound. In that moment, I finally realized why those conversations kept happening, why I kept excluding myself from those conversations. Like, I wanted to be accepted by other guys, but I didn't feel like I fit in. I I don't feel like I'm enough of a man Partially because I didn't like sports growing up and all men like sports. Everyone in my family likes sports. And so something broken must be inside of me. And I wanted to belong so I lashed out. This is my wilderness. The enemy of our souls constantly attacking my source of provision, protection, and position. So instead of responding in a kind way, in the truth of God that flows through my life, I took the enemy's bait and realized my tactic was, well, if I get them to walk away now, they won't abandon me later. But I just keep ending up alone in the wilderness. And maybe this vulnerability, maybe it resonates with someone. Maybe you feel something like this in your soul. What did Jesus do in these moments of temptation? He quoted scripture, right? So all we got to do is just read the Bible. All of our problems are solved. But remember back to last week? What came immediately before the 40 days in the wilderness? It was Jesus' baptism. It was that moment where heaven opened and the voice of the Father spoke, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Do you see what I was missing or the enemy was trying to say that I was missing? See, Jesus had the community of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. That, that's, that's belonging. That's protection. 
Jesus was called beloved. That's security. That's provision. Jesus went into the wilderness knowing his Father in heaven. It wasn't just that he quoted some old dusty books of scripture. Jesus knew the author. And he had experienced the power of his roar. See, the problem is that for us, social psychologists figured out a long time ago, even those that don't really believe in God, discovered that our view of God is most prominently shaped by the interactions with or absence of interactions with our earthly father early on in life. And to requote Kerry Newhoff from last week, this is the most fatherless generation in known history that did not lose their fathers to war. So the reality is lots of people in this space are probably resonating with more of this wound, even if it presents differently than aren't. But here's the thing. One of the most revolutionary things Jesus did was to tell us that we have a father. And he didn't just say, oh, that heavenly father person. Like, no, he said, you have an Abba. It's kind of like the word dada is to kids these days. Jesus came along and shocked the religious order of things when others wouldn't even say the name of God, lest it become less holy somehow. And he's thrown out the Abba, the fatherhood of God. See, Jesus didn't want us to keep the lion locked behind a cage like religion often tries to do. Like we want the power of God, but we want it to be safe and tame, right? But then along comes Mr. Beaver saying he's not safe. He was never meant to be safe, but he's good. See, the problem is we just haven't been taught how to hear the voice of our Father. So what did Jesus do to teach his disciples how to hear the voice of his Father? Well, turn a little bit farther in Matthew to chapter six. Verse nine says this, therefore, you should pray like this, our Father, our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Here's the thing though. We could be like the way the enemy wanted to tempt us to in the wilderness and just throw out some words from scripture that don't connect into our hearts or our lives. That's not what Jesus is teaching us here. He was opening up our father wound and teaching us to commune with our Abba, our Father. In his life changing, so powerful, you should stop reading whatever you're reading right now and go pick up a copy of the good and beautiful God, Falling in Love with the God Jesus Knows by James Bryan Smith. Book, Smith says this, Jesus reveals the nature of God, of the God to whom he prays in, con in uh, content of his prayer. His disciples asked him to teach them how to pray, presumably because Jesus' prayer life was vibrant and passionate. Jesus responded to the request by teaching them a prayer that is now familiar to many. He begins, or tells us to begin our prayer by addressing God as Father, which is what he did. But note this. The fatherhood of God is defined by the content of the prayer. What do we learn from his prayer? First, we learn that God is near, our Father in heaven. See, in Jewish cosmology, heaven did not refer to a place that was far away. Heaven referred to the surrounding atmosphere, the very air they breathed. In short, God is present Jesus' Father, listen to this, is nearby, holy, powerful, caring, forgiving, and our protector. These attributes provide strong images of who God is and what fatherhood means. And we now have a way to define the Father's goodness. Let me recap it for you. God as Father is nearby, 
holy, powerful, caring, forgiving, and our protector. See, Jesus is in the wilderness. And even though he doesn't have food, he's, he's hungry. He knows the source of his provision. Even though he's alone, he knows the community of the Father and the Spirit. Even though he was literally for a moment wasting away from within, he, he understood his position and the Father's voice roared out of heaven and it spoke over him. Now across the last 30 minutes, I've just unpacked about 15 years or more worth of my own journey. But I need you to know it wasn't until I discovered the fatherhood of God that that wound started to heal. And yes, God did have to cut it open a little bit farther. In fact, ironically, God took me deeper into that journey until my earthly father came back into my life. Out of prison, my, my dad accepted Jesus as his savior and he ended up becoming a part of my life for, for a few years before his tragic death. He even got to babysit my son. I got to look in the last days of my father's life upon a re restored relationship with my earthly father. But without rediscovering the fatherhood of God in my life, I would have stayed lost in the wilderness. What about you? Do you hear that roar? Do you want to hear that roar? Do you need that in your life? Are you in the wilderness where the hyenas of shame and doubt and culture and war and all these other things are coming against you and you just feel so in the dark, so alone, so afraid? Child of God, perhaps the next step on your journey is to rediscover the intimacy that Jesus lacking even his own earthly father, had with his heavenly father. And know that God the Father is your father. He will not leave you as orphans. He is coming to be with you. So how do you start this journey? Well, I wish I had three steps to rediscovering manhood in Jesus, but it's just not that simple. Our Wounds are far more complex, as that man in my dream said. My journey to being fathered by God has led me to where I am now. And while I'm in a much different place than I was a few years ago, I am still growing. I am still healing. So I can't tell you exactly what you need to restore your soul, but I can tell you where to start. Start with the fatherhood of God. And pray as Jesus taught us to pray, our Father, who is present and strong, surrounding us, who is holy and powerful like a lion roaring at the devils that chase us, may your upside down kingdom come. The one where the broken are healed and made whole. The ones where the smallest become the greatest. And as that happens, May more of heaven invade the oxygen of earth until we have reclaimed together all that hell has stolen and bring more of heaven, more peace, more shalom on earth as it is. Thank you, God, for always providing for us. You, you always do, right? We, we doubt it sometimes. We, we worry about it often, but you always come through. Give us today our daily bread. And, and, and you know that temptation that, that rises its head up in our lives? May it hear the roar of the Father so that it delivers us from our own evil desires and the temptations of the evil one because we recognize you, Father, Abba. God the Father is your Father. And like I said last week, this isn't a journey where I can give you a magic pill and tomorrow it's better. Actually, what might need to happen in your life is that God starts to open up that wound. And I promise you won't like it at first. But once that healing starts to come, you start to experience everything Jesus felt in the wilderness. A sense of security, provision, protection, position, sense of belonging, 
A sense that you are not defined by the words of the enemy or the screaming doubt, fear, and shame that just won't shut up. You are defined by the roar of your Father. And when you turn to him, I promise you, you hear, you are my beloved child. So what do we do with this if we can't fix it all immediately, guys? Let's start the journey together. Coming up here soon, we have a men's event. We're gonna put the link up on screen and, and you can see it in your altitude.church slash events page. I wanna encourage you to sign up to be a part of that. Come hear what God is speaking through that and start fellowshipping with other guys. And then guys, let's come back next week as we learn what it means to face the darkness together. Because I promise you, even though it feels like you're wandering in the wilderness, the roar of your Abba is loud. And it will heal. It will guide. It will restore. All we have to do is turn our ears back to the Father. Hey there, my name's Gage. I'm the worship leader here at Altitude. And I just wanted to say thanks for being here. We love spending this time together every week, but this is just a small part of what we do as a community on a weekly basis. And if you are interested in being a part of that community in a deeper, maybe more uh, tangible way, then I got some links down below that you can check out right now. That first one is gonna be a uh, plan your visit link. Once you do, click that, fill out the digital form that lets us know that you are going to be here so we can prepare to host you well. The second one's gonna be the life groups. That is the lifeblood of this community. If you're looking to get to know some people and be known by those people and know God together, that's gonna be where to go. That third link, that's the calendar. Go there, see what we've got going on outside of Sunday mornings. Come be a part of what we've got going on outside of Sunday mornings. We love to host our town. We love going out into the town. So see where we'll be, see what we're doing, you're invited. And then lastly, that fourth link, that's gonna be the giving link. You know, we are a not-for-profit organization, so anything that you give there goes right back into the community but we are very serious and very passionate about giving to the community. So if you want to partner with us financially in that way, or even just give a one-time gift, that's the link there and thank you in advance. But well, we've had a good time being together today. So glad that you could be a part of it. And we hope to be seeing much more of you in the future here at Altitude Church. Have a great week. We'll see you next time.